One way to find out where a 3D printed design is weak is to put it into service and let it fail. Sometimes you can deliberately apply more stress than you expect it to be able to endure and still be surprised when it fails. Welcome to my 3D printing lab, where today we're going to be testing some parts to destruction. Last time, I was able to put together a workbench torque arm that achieved at least minimal functionality. This video starts with taking that all apart again. Almost all the components are due to be overhauled or redesigned. One, the base pivot was too wide and too loose, and it doesn't work for me to screw it into a plank of wood. Two, the upper stage linkages need to be more precise, with a source of torsional force that's both more reliable and easier to fine tune than bits of surgical tubing. And three, the tool holder needs to be more rigid while also being more adaptable. Let's get started. I designed a lower profile base axis by replicating my successful second stage bearing design. This is constructed as before from four parallel races of six millimeter plastic airsoft BBs threaded around a single 80 millimeter M8 bolt. I had this desk clamp left over from another project which I'm using to replace the wooden plank. The internet provides no consensus solution for desk clamps, so I'm just using something I already had. Once I had it locked to the desk, however, it was flexing way more than I wanted. So I put my weight on it and it gave way. Much more easily than I expected. On close inspection, it was clear that the bolt shaft ran out only a little ways past the narrow part of the throat. So there was not much holding that part of the base together. Since that was the longest bolt my hardware store carried, I decided to try a different approach. I reprinted the base with the region around the shaft hollowed out. I wanted to reinforce that weak area with a tangle of metal wires, which I sourced from the office supply store. Inexpensive paperweight resin encases the wires and adds its own rigidity. It also provides a satisfying heft. The resulting pivot has virtually no flex. I was able to improve the precision of the linkage pivots by adding bushings. Because the bushings print vertically, they provide a nearly exact fit around the M5 bolts that act as shafts, even though the blocks they slide into are nowhere near as precise. I swapped out the new bearing blocks on the stage two vertical pivot bearing. This also gets rid of the attachment point for the old tubing springs, which are no longer needed. The redesigned upper linkage is chunkier to accommodate its internal tensioning system. 
As a result, I gave it some styling to make it look a little sleeker, including some unnecessary color trim. I could have used multicolor printing here, but honestly, printing out the trim separately and attaching it was just as easy. Upper and lower linkage arms are attached to the effector end bearing block. These bearings work the reverse of the old ones, holding fast to the linkage arms and moving freely in the bushings in the bearing blocks. The tensioning system will be using this 5mm bungee cord, which will be fastened using these end tabs. The cord snaps into position and is then locked in place using ordinary straight pins. Take care pushing pins through bungee cord, it takes a lot of force. Once seated, the pin can be clipped off and bent to secure it, and the cord can be trimmed. The bungee cord will run inside the cavity, formed by the two linkages, and between a series of pulleys, to produce the torque to hold up the tool. Here's how it works. The cord feeds from a spool on the top linkage through a series of pulleys around a pulley on the bottom linkage and is then fastened back to the top linkage again. Connecting the linkages by a pulley results in a mechanical advantage of two to one. When the bungee cord is under tension, it produces a force between the two linkages, and the lever arm between them converts that to a torque. It takes about a meter of bungee cord to traverse back and forth between the pulleys. Any length of bungee could produce the same force, but by making the overall cord longer, it meant I could get finer control over changes in tension. Even if changes in configuration altered the length of the cord's path, the tension would remain more consistent. The winch handle allows the bungee to be tightened and loosened. The axis contains a ratcheting mechanism which normally turns only one direction, but can be unlocked to turn freely. The winch axis is connected to a spool. The free end of the bungee cord is connected where it can wind around the spool and tension the cord.
With the second stage linkages assembled and the torsion mechanism in place, the upper and lower assemblies can be brought together. I redesigned the tool holders, not only to hold my Dremel in much better registration, but to be based on a French cleat system. The tools engage with a cleat at the end of the arm and are held down with a screw that locks them in place. Now is the moment of truth. Could my winch generate enough force to hold up my half kilogram Dremel tool? I turned the crank, the force increased. I had high hopes. Oh, that wasn't a good sound. The brake was in a fairly obvious place. The layers had parted under the stress of a pulley shaft. I redesigned the area with screws in front of the shaft to distribute the load and help hold the layers together. This time, when the bungee cord had reached the limit of how much it was able to stretch, there was just enough torque to counterbalance the tool. Once off the table, the arm went all over the place. The bearings might work a little too well. I quickly fashioned gaskets from two millimeter craft foam to add a little friction. That helped the arm hold its position a lot better. There's still more I want to improve with this design, and I'm going to do that in future videos. But for now, it's far enough along that I can start exploring new tool types. So I'm going to end today by building a tool for installing heat set threaded inserts. I've never used these myself before, instead preferring to tap threads in plastic or just make untapped holes for small screws. So this is an experiment. After having tried it, I may change my approach. The inset tool works really well, and the insets are strong. Thanks for watching. See you next time.